On a dirt track in southern Sudan, an old man, all matchstick limbs, flees for his life. In his etiolated, enfeebled state, the odds are against him. Ahead is a walk of some 50 miles to the nearest town with food. He leaves behind him only starvation and horror. What the local Dinka tribesmen say was a massacre of men, women and children. What happened in this marshland has its origins in another part of Sudan, 150 miles away. The United Nations relief plane lands at a place called Nasa. More aid flights reach here than anywhere else in the country. This bend of the river is, relatively speaking, a land of plenty. The flights get through with permits from the Sudanese government. Nasser is the headquarters of a new rebel leader, who in the name of democracy has split the guerrilla movement in southern Sudan, and in doing so appears to receive more than a little encouragement from Khartoum. Commander Riak Mashar is 38 and has a doctorate in engineering from Bradford University. His tribe, the Nua, regard him as a saviour, someone they've been told to expect by a 19th century prophet. Riak's fight, he says, is for democracy, but it's tribal as well, his Nua warriors distinguished by marks across the forehead. From an old comrade in arms, there are bitter words. They will be known in history as people who stabbed the movement in southern Sudan in the back. Uh, they, uh, they will be known as people who, at the point of victory, when we were going to win, uh, this, they, 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 they stabbed us in the back. In contrast to the rich Muslim north, southern Sudan is Christian and poor. John Garang from the Dinka tribe has led the rebel SPLA since it was founded in 1983. It's reduced the government to three strongholds in the south, the capital Juba and the garrison towns of Wau and Malakal. The rebel split came last August. Riek Mashar, formerly fourth in the high command, accused Garang of being a dictator and set up on his own in Nasa in the Nur heartland. Garang didn't like semblance of institutions, of structures, of democracy within the movement. He is interested in running the movement as his personal property. A dawn parade of new recruits in NASA. The split in the SPLA with its tribal overtones has inevitably meant more than just a trading of insults. This may be the Christian South, but in the months leading up to Christmas, an army of young Nur soldiers, militia and tribesmen marched south through the Dinka villages, including John Garang's birthplace. It was to be a wide and bloody sweep. To reach some villages visited by the marauding army, you have to travel by foot, a trek of over a hundred miles. The cameraman who took this film was the first journalist to go there. In his words, everywhere there was a stench of death. On the edge of the marshland, a vulture has been picking at a human corpse. Great herdsmen that they are, in this region the Dinka lost all their cattle. It's impossible to know how many people died, some say more than 5,000. Many ran from the villages to hide in the swamp and were slaughtered there. Some were strangled, others were shot. This woman said the soldiers had arrived looking for John Garang's men. They'd come, she says, with the magician. His spells had protected the outsiders from death, but not her people. Bodies were left in the marshland to the mercies of the hyenas. We were unable to bury them. We have no manpower, no energy. We could bury them. These were our brothers and our sisters. The regional hospital only has a few patients left. Anyone seriously wounded died for lack of drugs. I was not physically there, no, but, but by radio, the yes, the yes, yes, as the commander of the forces. They were in touch with me, yes. They were in touch with me. And they had the specific instructions. Civilians, we have no quarrel with them. 
I cannot just say, kill the Dinka bull. No, not at all. They're using it as a human rights violation. I'm aware of it, but I think it is propaganda. Everywhere the cameraman went, he met people looking for their relatives. The child is frightened by the camera. But his father, an SPLA gorilla, has something to smile about. He's found his son again. A young herdsman, Ajak, fled when the fighting began. Now that things have quietened down, he's come back to his hometown of Congo to look for his mother. He's been looking for her for the past two weeks. In his absence, Congo has become a virtual ghost town. Only a few old people have stayed behind. This old man was simply too weak to move. The population of Congo was over 10,000. It's now less than 100. Ajak didn't find his mother and he moved on, continuing his lone search. Most villagers took to the swamps during the fighting, where increasingly the problem is finding anything to eat. They've begun to harvest the water lilies. Despite widespread malaria and other diseases, the Dinka have made camp on islands in the marsh. The staples were meat and milk. Now in desperation, there's only the water lily seeds ground into an edible paste. The process takes about a week, and the result is flavorless and of minimal nutritional value. The best that can be said about this clay-like paste is that it can keep you alive, just. Three miles away, the airstrip at Congo. No planes have landed here for at least four months. The Sudanese government strictly limits the number of planes going to areas under the control of the SPLA. Still, a few women and children while away the day, waiting and waiting, in the remote hope of a United Nations flight bringing in supplies. The biggest single concentration of refugees in southern Sudan is to be found in the town of Bor, John Garang's birthplace. It's a place of starving children, a refugee camp that has sprung up since the attack by Riak's men. When the cameraman was there, the only food available was biscuits for children. The United Nations is mounting an operation by road to bring in more supplies. This is the rebel front line. Most of the SPLA's hardware has been thrown into the siege of the southern capital, Juba. Government forces exploiting the distraction of the Riak attack pushed them back some 10 miles, and another government offensive is expected imminently. This is the ninth year of war in the south, and in John Garang's view, democracy can wait. Democracy had been so much beaten up these days that even the devil can come and say he's a Democrat, people will listen to him. Uh, in a way, uh, in the SPLA, we are a victim of our own image, of our own success. So the SPLA is a tool. Uh, a tool cannot be democratic. It's a tool in order to bring about a democratic society. The rebel campaign is now dogged by tribalism. Even if the two main tribes, Nur and Dinka, have intermarried for over a century, what happened in the marshland won't be easily erased from Dinka memories. In the last two years, southern Sudan has been hit by drought and then floods. In this war zone, more than most, the brunt of the suffering falls not on soldiers, but on civilians. As of this moment, the UN estimates that across southern Sudan, there are some two million people dependent on its aid. Some clearly get more than others. A Dakota DC-3 is one of two planes which ferries in supplies every day to Nasser. Where the food is needed most, among the Dinka villagers, 
the problem remains of getting a flight permit from Khartoum. Thank you.